Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold, and it is time for Guide Talk, or Guys Who Talk. I've got a professor, a pastor, and a Sunday school teacher ready to take your questions. Let me know what they are. 877-933-2484. Again, 877-933-2484. I've got a particular question in a sealed envelope uh, here (laughs) that I haven't even opened yet. I'm going to open and read it at the same time. You're right, Jeff. So let me introduce uh, the panel. The professor is Dr. Greg Borgond. The pastor is Tom Parrish. And the Sunday school teacher is, of course, Jeff Verdorn. Welcome, gentlemen. One <laughs> it's at a time. good to be here. Good to be here, Bill. Always oh, good so to be much. here, Bill. Hello, Bill. The origin of the name Greg, where did, you, where did that come from? I don't know exactly where it came from. My parents gave me that name, obviously, but my last name is totally French. Yeah. So uh, Greg but, is not French. No, I know, but is Greg a, an uncle, a grandpa? Is there any connection no. to the name Greg? No. Nothing. Not that I'm aware of. Huh. As a matter of fact, my mother we gave me a middle name saying it was my grandfather's name, and when we found his birth certificate after his death, it wasn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, all right. So two names that... I don't know where they came from. So you can't connect any dots to the name no, Greg in your no. family. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What about you, Tom? Uh, I had an uncle named Tom. Okay. And I think I was named after my uncle yep. in that regard. Uh, I know that my middle name, which is Vernon, uh, my grandmother, who died unfortunately quite young, uh, did let it out that uh, she liked the name Vernon because there was an actor named Bobby Vernon, which was my dad's name, when she was just a little girl in the silent film era. Hmm. And I had no idea. I've looked him up, and it doesn't mean a thing to me. Okay. All right. Jeff. Jeff means God's peace. Nice. I like that. Uh, Jeff was actually my mom's favorite boy's name in 1963, the year I was born. (laughs) And uh, so that was her favorite name. I had an older brother, and she wanted to name him Jeff. But there was an, I had a cousin named Jeff Verdorn, and he had just been born, so they decided not to. But when I came along three years later, she said, I don't care. I'm ma- naming him Jeff. Wow. I like it. And how do you come up with Wyatt? What comes to mind when you think of the name Wyatt? Wyatt Earp. Wyatt Earp. Exactly. Now, I have no idea if I'm named after Wyatt, <laughs> but that's what everybody tells me. You should so. have done some research, Wyatt. Yeah, yeah. Next yeah. time. Next time. Yeah. What about Bill? William. Well, I was well, uh, I was born uh, Saul, and I had a radical experience. <laughs> my name got changed to Bill, so there you go. Uh, I like it. Yeah, yeah. So 877-933-2484. Gentlemen, I am looking in Matthew chapter 7, which is a powerful chapter. But let me ask you this. Starting in verse 13, it says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. So when it says, enter through the narrow gate, it sounds like something you go do yourself. Well, that would be a picture of faith. Okay. If Jesus is the gate, which there's a number of passages when Jesus says, I am the gate to the sheep, I am the door to heaven, Jesus is the way, uh, but you have to put your faith in Jesus mm-hmm. in order to be saved. So that narrow gate, uh, and I like, I love this passage, by the way. It's not narrow because it's hard or difficult. It's narrow, I think, because it's exclusive. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So this lie of the world, by the way, we just had a, uh, can I can I talk about the Pope and what he just said uh, about you can do whatever two weeks like, ago? Jeff. The, the Pope <laughs> just, and actually to the consternation of a lot of Catholics as well, yeah. which is right, He said that all roads lead to God. I think that's one of the big lies of the world, that all roads lead to God. There's one way, one road, one gate, one door, and that is through Jesus Christ. That's the narrow gate that leads to everlasting life. But we enter it is a picture of belief or faith. I'm wondering, the uh, 
way in which it describes it, narrow versus wide, if there's an implication, is narrow simply mean few people find it, or is it really narrow, and why is it narrow? Is it because there's only one way? I think that's probably the reason. There's only one way, not multiple ways, just as you suggested with the yeah. I see it as a word picture. Absolutely true, but almost like a parable. It's kind of like standing across the field, and you have somebody say to you, there are two ways to get across the field and get into that other place. One is that really big, wide gate up there. Can't miss it. But there's a narrow gate up there, too. You go through that one, you'll find your way through, and it's even better. I don't think it was Jesus telling us, we've got to figure this out and go look for narrow gates. What he's doing here is identifying himself. I am the narrow gate. There are lots of other paths that people want to talk about to the kingdom, but I'm the one that matters, and if you don't come to me, you don't get through. Can I bring up one more thing? I'd love to get you guys' thoughts on this, because we often hear that you you go through the narrow gate and the, 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 the small gate and the narrow road, and you, you then are on your way to eternal life. But then there's a lot of teaching within the church that we need to stay on the narrow path, right? We need to keep on the narrow path our whole life because if we fall off, you know, then the the implication is is then we're going to be on the broad road to destruction. And it's kind of like, well, can you lose your salvation or not? Which we've talked about a right. lot on this program that we have true assurance of salvation. I I think the picture is this that when you believe and are saved, you've gone through the narrow gate, you're on the narrow road to salvation. And because we have assurance of salvation, you can't get off that road. The, the meta, in other words, the metaphor, oh, you better stay on the straight and narrow or stay on the narrow road. It is not correct when it comes to Christianity, because the Bible teaches that once you're born again, you're born again for all of eternity. You're on the narrow road to eternal life. If you put your faith in Christ, you see what I'm saying? I do. If, if you're, if you enter through the narrow gate, Assuming that there is a narrow road to travel, to me, flies in the face of Scripture that says there's a new creation, a new world, a new life. So much is new. So to me, as soon as you go through that gate, God opens up a whole new world to you. And all of a sudden, the peripheral of your life gets much larger. They, and it's just wider at that point. Their choices are beautiful and wonderful when you submit to the Lord. You know, when you think about it, stepping through that narrow gate, which I agree with, you know, that has to happen. I don't know how the Lord does it. In my case, I think he drugged me through the narrow gate, you know, <laughs> waking me up and calling me to faith. But the bottom line is, it's real easy for church leaders, especially like me, to then want to tell Christians, hey, this is what you got to do. If yeah. You want to stay right with the Lord. You got to give more. You got to do this over here. It's a different thing to tell Christians, I'm not going to tell you what to do. You need to look to the word, but you need to do it out of thankfulness. And everything you do from this point on is because you're thankful. When you take that kind of an attitude, it's no longer the question of am I saved or not saved. It's the question of because I am saved. Correct. I'm so thankful, and I'm going to do this out of thankfulness to Jesus. I'm, he's a much better motivator than I am. Mm. Jeff, I love the reference you made to John fourteen six, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. All right, now, that's an outrageous claim. And don't you have to examine the evidence when you hear a claim that sounds that outrageous? I would hope so. I mean, if if the IRS sent you a letter saying you owe a million dollars in taxes and you'd never made more than $30,000 a year, it's so outrageous of a claim. You'd have to go, this can't, I got to examine this. Yeah. So, so it's kind of like you're saying, well, prove that to me, Jesus, right? You've just made a claim. You're the only way to God. Well, you're going to have to show me. You're going to have to prove this to me. Well, he actually does that, yeah, sure he right? Does. He says, "He says I'm going to give you a sign. This sign is the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then I'm going to rise again. Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. I'm going to be handed over to the Gentiles, crucified, put to death, but I'm going to rise again. He told his disciples over and over and over what was going to happen. And guess what? It happened just as he said. He fulfilled the sign of Jonah. He rose from the grave. There's no other religious leader in all of history anywhere in the world 
that has ever risen from the grave other than Jesus Christ. Agreed. Well done, gentlemen. Off to a great start. This motivates me to announce that next Thursday we are going to be in Sioux Falls. Yeah, and right. if you want to come, uh, if you're in the Sioux Falls area or you are in a surrounding area and can jump in your car and join us, you can right now text the word Bill to 877-933-2484, and it provides a link with all the details. We will be there live and in person in Sioux Falls next Thursday for Guide Talk Live. We're going to look forward to that. Thank you, uh, gentlemen, for agreeing to, to go to Sioux Falls. Oh, I'm look, really looking forward to it. It'll be great. Yes, yeah. we are. And I know it's going to be several hours on the Greyhound, so thank you very much for <laughs> agreeing to do that. All right, uh, here's my next question. It comes from Gary. We know that in the millennium, Satan will be removed from the earth. Does that also apply to demons and other demonic forces? I don't know how it can apply to that simply because people are going to resist Jesus even in the millennium. They're going to be tempted even in the millennium. And Scripture says that God tempts no one. So there's going to be some influence, whether or not it's a personification of a demon or or the enemy himself. um, I don't know. But the fact is there are going to be temptations. There's going to be sin. There are going to be people that are going to turn from God, even though he's there in the physical presence and the embodiment of Jesus Christ. So let's read the passage that this question refers to. This is in Revelation 20, and Jesus has just come back at the end of the tribulation. His feet stand on the Mount of Olives. There's this great earthquake. He begins to reign at that point, and he reigns on earth for a thousand years. So in Revelation 20, verse 2, it says that Jesus, he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on it so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. Yeah. But at after these things, at the end of the thousand years, he will be released for a little while. So what Greg was saying is he's absolutely right. Satan is no, is going to be bound. He's no longer there. But the question is, well, what about all, all of his minions, all the demonic spiritual forces in the heavenly realms that are demonic. Scripture doesn't say one way or another. Uh, But as Greg, as you pointed out, there's still going to be, even though the millennial reign starts with only saved people, only righteous, those saved people in bodily form will have children and their children will have children. And many of them, while they will be under the kingship of Jesus Christ as King of Kings of the whole earth, they won't ever receive him as Lord, as yeah, personal as Lord. Savior. And so you're right. There will be sin and rebellion and so on. And that is exactly how God uses Satan at the end of the thousand years. He releases them to deceive the nations and separate them out once more. And they actually surround the city of Jerusalem to take over the kingdom. And it says later in Revelation 20 that fire comes down from heaven and destroys them. And that's the final rebellion. All right. We're going to take a little break and come back with lots of guy talk. 877-933-2484 is the number to text your question. I'll say that again. 877-933-2484. We'll be right back. We carry each other's burdens. Please know you can bring us your prayer concerns and we will pray. Share your prayer requests with the Faith Radio team by texting or calling 877-933-2484 or share your prayer requests with the Faith Radio staff and listeners at myfaithradio.com. Thank you for listening to Guy Talk. Or Guys Who Talk, I've got the power panel here. I'm looking at them right now. And they are Greg B., Tom P., Jeff V., and they're ready to take your questions, and they're good ones. We got some good questions coming in. Here's an interesting one, gentlemen. Uh, does God answer some people's prayers more than others according to their spiritual gifts? I think those are two separate questions. Does the first one is does God answer prayer more than others? I suppose He does, but not because of anything that they've done. It may be just because of what God's capable of doing for him or the exigency of the time. But 
I don't see anywhere in Scripture do you guys where prayer effectiveness or prayer being answered is tied to your gifts. <clears throat> well, James 5.16 says the prayers of the righteous availeth much. Right. But then the question is, who's righteous? Right? Isn't everyone, everyone righteous? Yeah, yes. Because we wear the mantle of Christ. Correct. That's, what I was, that's where I was going. Everyone who has believed in Jesus Christ is righteous. So the prayers of the righteous availeth much. The only other verse I can think, I think it's in Timothy, where it says, uh, how you treat your wife so it won't hinder your prayers or, right. or something like that. I can't remember exactly that verse. Um, so so there seems to be you could be acting in such a way, especially in, maybe in your marriage where you, maybe your prayers are hindered in some way, shape, or form. But look, how God responds to prayer is a gigantic mystery, mm-hmm. right? He's working, Greg, you've often described it as God playing 3D chess yeah. in the world, and we're seeing in two dimensions, right? So yeah. he, we know this. He's working all things for good for those who love him. Yeah. That's right. And I think you can take confidence in that. I think too many Christians feel like, well, I can understand how Greg's prayers are answered. He's on the radio. He's a professor. He does all this stuff, you know, but my prayers don't get answered that way. And I think what we have to do is to help people go back and to understand understand how the Lord answers prayer for those who ask. And it's usually through, again, I'd love to see a great miracle. I've seen some miracles in my life, like we all have. But the majority of the time, his answers come through people, through situations, through opportunities. Circumstances, right. And I'm not sure that all of us are as aware of that as we ought to be. One of the things I tell the members of my church, I encourage them to keep a prayer log. Now, you don't have to do it in detail. I'm not asking you to write. But you need to write down because if you, let's say, in August, ask for something really big in your life and you wrote that down, you prayed about it for three, four days, and now you have been on to something else, and the Lord answers that, will you be aware? You just had a direct answer. Some do. Some don't. And sometimes I've had to ask people, well, had you been praying about that before? Well, yeah, but that was a year ago. But it's answered now, right? Oh, Hadn't thought of it that way. Hmm. So human beings, we're all different. We see things differently. And I don't want to put the emphasis on the spiritual gifts. I want to put it on the gift giver. He does what he knows is best when we need it. I agree. I want to go back to something you said at the beginning where you said, does God hear, you know, like Greg's prayers more than everybody else's? Well, maybe more than ours. uh, But but no, I think this is actually a common common kind of attitude that a lot of Christians have that, oh, I'm, I'm not as holy as this other guy or as my pastor. And, you know, I want the, the, the holier people, you know, the Billy Grahams of the world, if you will, to be praying because, you know, God's not going to hear my prayer as much. I want to read a verse from Hebrews 4, verse 16, where it says this, let us therefore, this is us, meaning the body of Christ, meaning every single believer who is in Christ, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you are in Christ, you can come before God's throne of grace with confidence, knowing that you've received forgiveness, you've been cleansed, and you've been brought near to God through faith in Christ. There There is a quick story. I was in an old church in Greece, and our tour guide uh, was a young lady. We had been talking about the Lord and the Bible. She was Greek, Greek Orthodox. This church was a thousand years old. And at the front, there was a tiny little like three inch step up to the platform where the, the pulpit was. Well, I went on that step and was behind the pulpit. And I noticed that she didn't step up there. And so I asked her, why is this elevated and so on? And she says, well, that's where the priest would go and only the priest. And I asked her, I said, well, should I get down from here? And she said, oh, no, 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 you're a teacher of God's word. You can be up on that Mm. platform. This three-inch step. Mm. And I said, you know, everybody who is in Christ can step up here. You can come before the throne of grace with confidence. And she said, oh, no, 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 I would never step up there. Mm. See, you see what's going I, on? I don't see the, this is why I don't see the church being effective in our culture, because we keep looking to the special people that come along. Exactly. And we keep saying, it's got to be a Franklin Graham, or it's got to be this person or whatever. I can't do that. I don't have the ability to do that. When in reality, with Jesus, you already have the ability. It's how you're going to put it to work. And are you going to work with others to make things happen? 
And the more we're willing to do that, the more we can be out in the front. I remember one military guy, he said to me, he said, we make credit Patton and Eisenhower winning World War II, but he said they weren't on the front line. I was. And he said it was the grunts on the front line that were getting shot at and shooting and living and dying. They really won the war. They gave us the strategy, and they were right, and I'm thankful. But if we wouldn't have been on the front lines, it wouldn't have happened. And that's Christianity. It is not just the guys in the pulpit or the teachers. It is the people on the front lines of life. There may be a bad illustration, but I often see God interacting with us in prayer like a Rubik's Cube, where certain things have to be put in place in a certain way, or certain circumstances have to come to light, or somebody might not be ready yet to play their part in the the answer to our prayer. Mm -hmm. And that's where trust and faith comes in. That we don't know, just we talked about the 3D chess set, we don't know what's happening on level two and three. We're only responsible for what happens on level one, and that's to go ahead and ask God for our request, that we can bring everything to him. And then we need to trust him that he's going to act in our best interest. I thought that was a good illustration. (laughs) (laughs) Well done. Maybe that's the reason the host chair also has an ottoman, where I can put my feet up. (laughs) I love it. <laughs> yeah. Someday we'll all be Someday. there. Someday. Someday, Tom. All right. Here's a question, gentlemen. How did Satan take Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple and also show him all the kingdoms of the world at once? Was this in the spiritual realm or physically? How could he do that with Jesus since light and darkness have nothing to do with each other? Well, the enemy has the capacity to project. He has the capacity to sow thoughts in our mind, um, whether or not he physically took Christ to the pinnacle or he um, there was a, a, a kind of like a vision of, of that pinnacle. Uh, I, I don't know which one it was, but the idea was he was trying to tempt him with possessions as if he had control over them by telling Jesus he would give him all these kingdoms. Yeah. If he would just bow down. There's always the conditional statement, if you do this, Jesus, then I'll do that. Every one of those three temptations in the desert in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11, has an if attached to it. And so, and the thing, it was interesting to me, he knows that he's God in the flesh, but he still believes somehow his temptation is going to work with Jesus and Jesus is going to end up bowing his knee or making a, a, a mistake. That shows you that Satan is not all-knowing, he's not all-powerful, and he's certainly not everywhere at the same time. He's a created being, supernatural albeit, but a created being. So let's read the language quick uh, in these two temptations. The first is uh, about bread, but that could have happened uh, physically right there where they were standing. The second mm-hmm. one is the devil led him up to a high place— and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. Well, it doesn't give us any more detail than that. Um, so f- bodily, physically, was he on the top of some high mountain someplace? You wouldn't see all the kingdoms of the world from any mountain, any high place, anywhere in the world. So this this is probably more spiritual than physical. The next line then is uh, the devil then led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. This sounds a little bit more physical, but again, uh, could it have been, a, you know, kind of a spiritual vision or, you know, something other than an actual bodily being up on the temple uh, in the highest place in Jerusalem? I think the important point here is the three temptations yeah. and the three responses yes. from Jesus where he brings the word of God to to bear in each of his responses to the devil, and then the devil left him. I teach men all the time about um, temptation, uh, that the strategy of the enemy uh, always focuses on three different types of temptation, just like Christ. It's either possessions or physical temptation. Um, It's either, uh, excuse me, it's physical uh, temptation or personal temptation. The second is its possessions or materialism, and the third is its pride and status. Interestingly enough, we're more susceptible to one of those at different ages in our life. Somebody who is in the age of 12, to say, in their 20s, are going to be tempted physically or, um, you know, sexually, or it's always about the body. The body. 
then when they start to build their career in the 20s up to 50, it's all about acquiring things, which can easily be turned into possessions that can control you. Then when you finally have acquired what you're going to acquire, you're no longer interested in that. You're interested in status and pride and mm-hmm. position and reputation. So those three areas is exactly where Satan tempted him. It's exactly where Satan tempted Eve, and it's exactly where the temptation is identified in First John. Those three areas. All right. What, I'm just, I just want to add to that, and here's the good news. The devil doesn't need to take me to all those places to tempt me. He mm-hmm. can tempt me right in my mind, right in my spirit, right when mm-hmm. I'm laying in bed, right when I'm driving my car. It can all be there. The issue is, who do I turn to when the temptation comes upon me? Well, don't you find it interesting that there's verbal communication between Satan and yeah. him? It's not a mind meld. No. Right. It's yeah. verbal communication. Absolutely. So then, and, and we got to read James 4, 7 at the end of this. Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Where do you turn? Submit yourself to God, and the devil will flee. Exactly. All right, my next question comes from Julie. She's driving home right now. Say hi, Julie. Hi, hi Julie. Hi, Julie. Yeah, cool. Do you think that's my Julie? No, it's not your Julie. Oh, okay. Yeah. Her question is about Isaiah 22, verse 14. It refers to sin that won't be stoned for. How do you wise men interpret this verse? Isaiah twenty-two fourteen, A sin that won't be stoned for. That's as much stalling as I can do. Well, the passage actually says it, 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 in verse 14, The Lord of hosts has revealed himself in my ears. Surely this iniquity, iniquity, iniquity will not be atoned for you until you die, says the Lord. Not stoned. Okay. So thank you very much, Greg. You have corrected that. So, Julie, uh, maybe you, maybe she might have texted with her voice. Yeah, yeah, that's happened to me a lot of times. So <laughs> that's the case. What she wanted to say was atone for. Mm-hmm. So, hmm. That, then you, that question still applies. Yeah. You know, surely this inequity will not be atoned for until you die, says the Lord of Yeah, hosts. that's the question. Yes. So anyone going to answer it? <laughs> well, I think the question, if it's atoned, not stoned, obviously, uh, I think the 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 premise of the question is the, is in the New Testament it says Christ is the atoning sacrifice for sins. So I'm reading into this question now, and maybe Julie can respond back. But I think the question is how can any sin not be atoned for if Christ is going to come and atone for all sin? Which is a, kind of a good question. See what I'm saying, guys? Mm-hmm. And I think that might be built into her question, even though that she didn't say that. Till your dying day, this sin will not be atoned for, says the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. So, um, well, it could also imply, as one scholar says, the sin of looking away from God to human self rescue. So, in other words, if you choose to live your life apart from God, even though God has provided for your atonement, it doesn't apply to you. And you will be paying the price for that when you die. Yeah, because we know that once Jesus comes, that he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, but not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So Christ atoned for all sins on the cross. That is the New Testament reality. So I think this probably, so we know this can't mean that there's some sin in the world that's Mm -hmm. not atoned for Mm -hmm. because Christ atoned Mm -hmm. for it all. So I think it goes to what, Greg, you just described. All right, we'll be right back with lots more Guy Talk. If you have a question, 877-933-2484. Sam's question is up next. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome to Guy Talk or Guys Who Talk. I've got Greg B., Tom P., Jeff V. Gentlemen, why would we want to be sending love and joy to our Jewish friends today? 
Oh, there's a Feast lot happening in Israel today, right. and they need the prayers of the church. Remember, uh, the people of Israel are still God's chosen people. They are the apple of his eye. And God told Abraham, uh, and thus I, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who became Israel and is the father of Israel, he says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. That is still true today. Church, we need to bless Israel, and we should pray for their safety because they are experiencing a threat to their existence like uh, like they haven't seen in a long, long time since the nation was once again formed and regathered in fulfillment of biblical prophecy on May 14th, 1948, as once again a nation after not being a nation for 2,000 years. That was a great answer, Jeff, but I really wanted... I was looking for happy Rosh Hashanah. Oh, just today. Just <laughs> say that. I'm just a simple You're man. Good. Yeah, but my next question comes from Sam, and she says that Guy Talk is my favorite show. I learned so much, so thank you, guys. I lead a fantastic small group of ladies, and we have questions. What is the name and history of the small black cap some Jewish men wear? Yarmulke, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's the yarmulke. Yeah. And it's it's uh, uh, from a passage, I believe, in Deuteronomy that says uh, that don't pray with your head uncovered. uncovered. Mm-hmm. And so they cover their heads. Yeah. And then what is the purpose of the different curled locks of hair that some Jewish men wear? Yeah, that's also in the law that it says don't cut the 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 hair on the side of your head, um, and so they grow the hair on their side of the heads long because in the law it specifically says not to cut the. That's the for hair the Orthodox. The yep, yeah, for the Orthodox, Orthodox Jews, Jews. They follow that literally. Yep. Yes. All right, gentlemen. What does many are called but few are chosen mean? Well, the message is for everybody. The gospel message, you know, the Lord's now respecter of people. So the message is for everyone because everyone needs to be saved. But in terms of chosen, you know, I think we use that term thinking about, well, Bill, you chose me and you chose this guy or that guy to do something, but you excluded others. I don't think that's what that chosen means at all in its context. Chosen is, is that we have responded to the offer of the Lord and we have received what he has given us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And once we have received that, then we're automatically part of the chosen. We're automatically part of the covenant. We're automatically part of his people. So uh, it's it's not so much the Lord chooses you and doesn't choose others. He wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Only a few, though, are going to do it. I, I agree with that 100%. I think it's everyone is offered salvation, but few. We just started the hour with the parable of the gates. You know, uh, small is the gate, narrow is the road that leads to eternal life. Few find it. Broad is the gate and wide is the road that leads to destruction, and many go through it. All are offered salvation. Few will become saved, will accept that offer of salvation and become part of the chosen, just as Pastor Tom said. Mm -hmm. I agree. All right, now it's time for the secret Whoa. Oh, the envelope. Secret question in the envelope. We've been waiting. That's Uh been sealed, and I'm reading it for the first time on the air. I'm making a little nervous. Um, let's see. It says, 1 Timothy 1.18, prophecies once made about you. 1 Timothy 1.18, prophecies once made about you. Question mark. Huh. Greg, you should answer this First one. Timothy. Yeah, this came from... He's sweating. I've never seen him sweat. <laughs> Well, it's my wife asking the question. Yeah, this is Mrs. Borgon who asked this question. She sent it along with Greg in a sealed envelope and said, do not open it, hand it to Bill. Mm. Now I'm opening it and reading it. Cool, and that's boy, fun. boy, is there sweat in the studio. Boy, <laughs> that's a lot It's hot in here. It is. So, so the question, let me understand the question, and I'll start talking here as he's reading the passage. So does does is she asking... What were the prophecies or? Well, I'm just reading the card. Prophecies once made about you. Yeah. So this is Paul writing to Timothy. We're actually doing First Timothy uh-huh. on Tuesdays sure. on, the, on my time. So we just covered this passage. So I'll, I'll give you my take in that Paul is writing Timothy. He's telling them that in these prophecies that were made about you, but we don't know what those prophecies are. We have, we have no idea. 
Um, and so, uh, he's also, Timothy was also anointed as a leader. He had great faith in his family and his grandmother and his mother. And then they, he was laid on hand, on hands and these prophecies that were made about him, but we actually don't know what they are, but Timothy becomes a, a, a very a prominent character in the life of Paul, uh, who wrote most of the new Testament, uh, and as a prominent character in the new Testament as well. So maybe it was prophecies about how, uh, you know, significant his uh, life and ministry was going to be. I I think it might ha- also have something to do with, let's say, Ephesians 2.10, where God has prepared in advance a purpose for your life. So every follower of Christ has a calling. And so that calling may become evident because somebody else sees something in you that you haven't seen in yourself. Or somebody feels that God is laying on their heart to tell you, I believe God's calling you into the ministry. I yeah. believe God's calling you to do this. And my my mentor uh, has often called this double confirmation, that when you receive some clarification from one source who doesn't know the second source, and that second source declares much the same thing, he's saying that's double confirmation from God of a prophecy for your life that you ought to pay attention to. So I, th- I think it might have something to do with that. One person put it this way. He said, God has spoken clearly through others to set Timothy aside, because that's where it's written to right here, for his ministry. This assurance of a specific divine calling is to strengthen Timothy for the work. So many of us, I think we were referring to this a little bit earlier. We don't feel worthy. We, don't, we know parts about our life that God will certainly not use me in this way. Sometimes it takes a brother or a sister who's strong in the faith to say, you're wrong. I, this is what I've seen in you. This is what God's laid on my heart to see in you. You need to do something about that and quit um, feigning that or quit resisting God's calling on your life. See, and we need to be doing that in the local church today. Hmm. Think of the young people we have, not just the teenagers, but also the elementary kids. You can already see in some of them, there, there is a, a sparkle in them for Jesus. There's something going on there. How do we fan that flame to get them excited about the future? Because, you know, the moment Satan has figured out that they're going to be somebody the Lord is going to use, he's going to come after them with everything he's got. Well, how do we encourage them to stay true? And a lot of that comes through, Greg, exactly what you're talking about. I look back at my life, and I think of the number of people that didn't even know one another who told me the same thing when I was young. And I thought they were crazy about the Lord is going to use you, the Lord's mm-hmm. hands on you. I, I would have never believed that. It happened, much to my surprise. But as I look back now, I think those people were speaking for the Lord, and I didn't even realize it at mm. the time. Mm-hmm. We need to do that for one another. You know, much of, Greg, what you were saying about uh, Paul encouraging Timothy and building him up, I mean, much of First and Second Timothy is Paul doing just that, not yeah. only for Timothy, but also for us through the church, right? And and uh, Pastor Tom, you said fan into the flame. I was just going to that passage. Second Timothy 1, yeah. six comes back to Paul talking to Timothy, and he says, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hand. So that was the time that he talked about the prophecy that had been told about you. He anointed him for his role in the church. And so, yes, I like you said, Tom, we need to be doing this more and more with people in the church as well. Jeff, I, Tom, you said that that people have done that in your yes. life. Has, has anybody ever said anything remotely like that yes. to you? Yeah, I got, I yes, a couple of stories. Absolutely. Would you be willing to share one? So about 30 years ago, I was taking a two-year class on Revelation and a one-year class on Daniel. And in the process of taking this class, uh, about three-fourths of the way through, many in the class, including the instructor, said, you're going to be teaching this one day. And I said, no, 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 that's not me. I'm just here to study the Word of God. No, and the whole class said, basically, no, you're going to be teaching this one day. Um, I didn't realize that I would end up spending 25 years of my life uh, uh, focused and studying uh, much of it on the end times and teaching end times and Revelation and Daniel and Matthew 24 and all these prophecies about the end time at the time. So uh, that was a that was so evident to everybody in the class, and I was blind to it at the time. Yeah, yeah. years ago, uh, my mentor s- assembled several of uh, men and women that he had been mentoring to LA to give them, a bl- and he chose 12 of them to give him a special blessing. And I was one of those he chose. 
and he put inside this this tin cylinder, much like a, a stick you were, or a thing you would hand off mm-hmm. to somebody in a race, a written blessing. Mm-hmm. And in that blessing was what he saw God was going to do in my life. That had a huge impact on me. Wow. He took it out of there and read it in front of everybody. Wow. So, yeah. Interesting. All right. Here's a little fun fact. Just the wonder of God. If all of the blood vessels in the human body were laid end to end, they would measure approximately 60,000 miles, enough to circle the earth more than twice. It's incredible. We're fearfully and wonderfully Mm. made. And he does that all in the womb in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that isn't highly respected in our culture anymore. Yeah. Powerful. Powerful. I thought we were just the result of random mutations and uh, stuff in in nature over millions. No, I'm just kidding. Well, you know, Psalm 139 is clear about it. Yeah. That God has superintended our formation in our mother's womb. That's what we're just talking about right now. I declared the number of days we would walk this earth. He wove us. He oversaw how we were woven together in, Mm. in that womb. He gave us a temperament. He gave us a set of talents. We, we didn't have any choice over that, that those selections or even the family or time we'd be born into. So none of us, as we've said in the past, are coincidences or happenstance or a mistake. Not one of you out there is a mistake. You need to know and That's appreciate right. that you were on the heart of God before you ever came to be. And don't let anyone ever tell you Amen. anything different. Mm. Amen. And just here's another little fun fact to produce one pound of honey a colony of honeybees must fly approximately 55,000 miles and visit about 2 million flowers. Wow. Now, far enough away from I don't me. Wanna, I don't want to work that hard today. So, Tom, you take us to break. <laughs> Let's see how you do. Well, I think what we need to realize is no, that— take No, take break. us to break. No, taking us to break. We'll be right back. Oh, is that all, <laughs> is that all you're going to do? Well, I don't know. Well, I'm, cue up the next question. Tell them the phone number— Oh, okay. Be professional. Well, yes, I, uh, I am. Tell him I'm that's sorry. his job. Well, I, I always shame him. He's shaming well, poor Tom. Uh, no, that's okay. That's okay. I'm used to it. <laughs> you've, got, you've got a question for us. We want to hear from you. So don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call 877. <laughs> <laughs> He's blowing that. Or text. No, There's or no text. phone calls. Or text. There's no phone calls? No, no, no. It's a no, text, it's a text line. message. Yeah. Oh, yeah text. It's Let a me text take over, message. Tom. Tom, you're <laughs> fired. <laughs> you're, you're fired. All right. We're going to take a break and be right back. If you have a question, text it over, 877-933-2484. We'll be right back. Welcome is a word said universally all over the world. Every language on the planet has their own way of making a friendly greeting. At Faith Radio, when we welcome, we really mean it. Learn more about us by requesting a free welcome pack gift. Text the word WELCOME to 877-933-2484. Or visit MyFaithRadio.com to request your welcome pack today. And a warm welcome to you. Welcome to Guy Talk, or guys who talk. I've got Greg B., Tom P., Jeff V. We're looking for your text questions. 877-933-2484. Gentlemen, if you sin against a fellow believer... Could that lead to not being able to get into heaven? Obviously, someone shouldn't do so anyways. Once you receive Jesus as Savior and Lord, there is nothing you could possibly do to remove yourself from the hand of God. Even if you didn't forgive a brother or you held something against them or you didn't ask their forgiveness, it's like any other sin. There may be some significant consequences. To that withholding forgiveness. I experienced that myself because I've done that in the past, withhold forgiveness, and it it cost me. So there are consequences, but it has nothing to do with your salvation or eternal security. It's not conditional. What's the counter argument that says, uh, Greg, I don't agree with that. I think you can lose your salvation. Go ahead, you guys. (laughs) <laughs> I, I had enough time going to break. You know, so yeah, I'm boy, you're you're traumatized, Jeff. What do you got? <laughs> you're turning the barrel, Jeff. <laughs> well, there, if you want to play the hypothetical, because all of us here have have discussed the idea of our assurance of salvation, because the overwhelming witness of Scripture is is that once you are born again, you're born again for all of eternity. God Amen. gives you the Holy mm-hmm. Spirit. That Holy Spirit will be with you for how long? Forever, Forever. right? 
Um, but I understand and get that there are many in the church that because of certain passages, some of the falling away passages, they teach that you can actually be born again and then be unsaved at some point in time, either through sin or you stop believing or whatever. Um, so that's, that's the hypothetical. Um, I just, it, it, it's, um, it, once you look at all of Scripture and the testimony of Scripture, it just becomes overwhelming the number of passages that declare that once you are born again, you're born again for all of eternity. So, One of the things I just uh, talked to my eighth grade students about was that in a rule of interpretation is just what you said, Jeff. You allow Scripture to speak to Scripture. Yeah. So you take the whole counsel of Scripture instead of cherry-picking a verse out because it's alarming— you need to inform yourself with the rest of what Scripture has to say about that, and you probably will come to a different conclusion. Even when there's a sense of two um, beliefs or two doctrines that seem to conflict, you still trust to God, or that at some other time when you grow in Christ, there'll be some other Scripture on a higher order that'll bring cohesion to those seemingly two incongruent pieces of Scripture. But even if they are, and they stay that way, you need to trust God that it'll be resolved over time and that both could possibly exist. But in this case, we're talking about eternal security. Scripture is clear. All of Scripture is said, once saved, always saved. I'm not a bit worried about my salvation. <clears throat> Jesus has done it all. I know that. It's by his blood alone that I'm saved. My issue comes in for me is that when I don't forgive my brother, if I don't forgive my neighbor, if I don't do that, I think I put a roadblock almost between me and what Jesus wants me to do. Not that he's not going to save me. He's already done that. But what it is is it diminishes, I think, the kind of reflection and the power I want to have flowing through me to other people. When you get in line back with Jesus, when you repent, that's where I've seen people's lives dramatically change. And we want to see that because we're not, again, we're not talking about a salvation issue. We're talking about a discipleship issue, a maturity issue. Mm -hmm. How do you grow up in Jesus? Well, if you and I are not the people that are the most repentant, are willing to forgive even our enemies, how can we expect the people we teach, the people that are in our congregation, or any of those to even do the same thing? Yeah, let me share with you my own personal testimony to this fact of not forgiving somebody. When I chose not to forgive somebody for an extended period of time because of the damage that they had done, I found myself going down all kinds of rabbit trails, conjuring up in my mind ultimate scenarios about either what would happen to them or what I would ask God to do to them. And it took me to the very dark places until I finally came to my senses and finally forgave this person, which didn't condone what they had done to my family, but at least I chose not to seek any further revenge, and the, it felt like the weight of the world was lifted off my shoulders. So not forgiving somebody is just like you're saying, Tom. What happens is, is you start accruing to yourself all these toxins of possibilities and conjured up uh, ultimate narratives, ultra narratives of, or alternate narratives of what you think is going to happen or what you think of that individual, and it just, draw, it just digs the hole deeper. I can speak from so personal So we should probably experience. talk about some of the Matthew 18 stuff. Remember, what we've been describing is the moment you believe and are saved, you are forgiven of all unrighteousness. All your sins, past, present, and future, uh, have been forgiven. You stand forgiven before God. So whether you harm someone else in the body or someone else in the body harms you, there's issues. You were just talking about some of them, uh, issues of forgiveness and issues of wrongdoing and so on. But one of the consequences is not the loss of eternal salvation. So Jesus in Matthew 18 actually talks about when a brother sins against you, you are to go to them, point this out, try to win them over. If they don't listen, then take two others along so that the matter may be established on the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse, then you bring them before the church. And here's the hard part. He then says, if they still don't listen to you, if, they, if you've been wronged, if they've sinned against you and they didn't listen to you, the witnesses of others that you brought with you or the church— he says, then put them out of the church and treat them as an unbeliever. That's hard to do. It's not that they become an unbeliever. Yeah, in regard. Treat them as one. Treat them as one. Kick them out of the, the church. That's hard. I wonder if the church 
of Christ in America really does that very well. All right. That's all we've got for hour one of Guy Talk, but there's plenty more ahead. I want to just give thanks to God for M. Grace, who's healing faster than expected. That thrills me to no end. To God be the glory. We're going to continue to uh, look for your questions on the text line, 877-933-2484. We'll be right back with hour two. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.